Welcome to the Theatre of Others podcast. My name is Adam Marple and I'm the co-artistic director of the Theatre of Others. With the COVID-19 pandemic forcing a shutdown and re-evaluation of space and gathering, we at the Theatre of Others are thinking about what stories we need and how best we can share them. We believe space is psychology and it informs the way in which an audience interacts and reacts to what is presented to them. We create uniquely theatrical events in bespoke sensory performance spaces crafted to encourage curiosity and grant the audience permission to commune with the play. Now that that space has moved online, how can we encourage interaction and action amongst an audience virtually? The Theatre Brothers produces plays that both welcome and challenge the audience. We are committed to international collaboration and are a laboratory that helps artists grow through intensive study of their craft. The Theatre Brothers creates a shared community of artists and audiences for the purpose of exploring the most profound issues of our lives and times. We believe the play watches the audience. The audience is necessary and they are witness to what happens and you get to be witness to us making that happen. The purpose of this podcast is to open up our process and let you in. We're peeling back the curtain, so to speak, and encouraging you to follow along, to ponder, prod, and question, to join us and criticize us if need be. Being a witness is no passive task, and it requires much from you. Are you up for the journey? On the podcast today from Melbourne, Australia, our co-artistic directors, Woody Miller, and myself in Cairo, Egypt. This podcast contains explicit language. Hi, Adam. Hi, Booty. How are you going? I'm doing well. How are you? <laughs> I'm very good. What's up with the multiple colors now? You have like a rainbow behind you. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I, get, I can change them, you know. I got to try and get some fun things happening back here. So it's not just ugly wall anymore. So I've got these lovely lights that the British council bought for us. So I'm using them. So I don't, I don't have, I don't have lovely Australian cloud top forest in the background. Like you, you can sometimes. So, you know, some of us just don't have the privilege as others. No, I live, I live in an ugly desert. So no. Yes. Filled with tar. The new, <laughs> the new fragrance from Tom Ford. Tar. The smell of Egypt. <laughs> it's just the smell of Cairo. It's not to Egypt. It's just oh, Cairo. The smell of Cairo. Yeah. The smell of Cairo in a bottle. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. <laughs> so, um, I've got some things happening. Oh, yeah. Do tell. Well, I'm in the process of becoming an ordained energy healer. Wow, what does that what does that entail? Me healing you. <laughs> okay. Cool. Great. I need some healing. I'll be healing you. Fantastic. And les autres who need healing with my awesome. energy. Can it can it come through the screen or do I need to be in the same room with you? No, it's energy. I can, I can, I can, I can do remote, remote healings. Yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's just it's just part of the, it's par for the course. Um, it's it's in addition to my theta healing. It's in addition to all of my chakra work. It's in addition to my research. It's my in addition to understand understanding toxic on a deeper level. And yeah, so. It's all, all happening. It all makes sense. It all makes sense. It all makes sense. How are you? How's Egypt? You just got Egypt back from the Red quiet. Sea. Yes. Egypt is quiet. It's still it's the last couple of days of Ramadan. And um, spring break on top of that. And apparently today is an ancient Egyptian holiday. I can't remember the name of it. But it roughly translates to like new breeze or fresh breeze and it's the it's their recognition of when spring starts and it mm. dates back 7000 years so it's a crazy old holiday which is great um wow. it's just quiet it's just really lovely and quiet and nobody is around right now cuz everybody's out of town and it's just it's okay it's not gotten too terribly hot it was lovely at the red sea perfect perfect weather 
I've got a nice, nice bronze, as you can see. And uh, yeah. yes, it's a very nice bronze. I'm feeling, I'm feeling very refreshed and grateful. You for look life. refreshed. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and rejuvenated. Indeed, indeed. <laughs> you look so good. Oh my god, you're sexy. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> Do you see my t-shirt? Irvine. Yes. Yes. Irvine Theaters. UC Irvine. Yes. We're going to have a UC, the head of acting from UC Irvine coming in and so. chatting with us. Andrew Borba. So. Yes. Andrew Borba will be here, ladies and gentlemen, non-binary conforming individuals. Part so, of our grad school series. Yes. Yes. Part of our grad school series. There's so many things going on. Like we're doing all these things. We're just, it's got a lot of stuff this year. Yeah. yeah, so busy, busy girls and boys yeah. and non-binary yeah. conforming individuals. Yes. <laughs> so, um, is Goldie writing a play? Uh, currently, in this moment, probably not. But he will be this year. Yes, we are. We are doing a. We are doing a show uh, that we're going to take to COP twenty eight in Dubai. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's that's he will be writing that, and we will be working on that later on this year. So our Dubai listeners will be there. Oh, maybe we should do like a maybe we should do like a a live podcast in Dubai. We could, we absolutely could. Yeah, that'd be fun. That'd be fun. We could we could do a a live podcast and a Q and A with the audience. Yeah, and yeah. Make it a big deal on location, live on location with the theater of others. Amazing. That would be amazing. <laughs> Just amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to have, we're actually going to have two productions this year. We're going to have that production and mm-hmm. we're going to do an audio play version of the show that I did at COP27 last year. So there's those two things. We've got some stuff to do this year. We got, we've got, We've got training in Bali. We've got our plays. Mm. We've got mm. work with others. We've got mm. workshops. We've mm. got book club. All these things. All these doing things. It, We're doing, We're doing it. it. Exactly. We've got book club. Yeah, we do. What's a book club? What, well, what are we doing for a book club? Oh, God, Booty, you didn't, you didn't read this month's book? <laughs> oh, this is going to be an awkward next hour. Oh, boy. Wait a minute. Oh, we have a dear. book yeah, we have a book club where we read. Okay, a book wait. Let's just talk month. about it because maybe I've maybe I've heard about it at least. Let's just talk about it. Let's just talk about it. Okay. Yeah. So we're supposed to read a book every month mm-hmm. and talk about it, and hopefully our listeners have also read the book, mm-hmm. so they can be part of this conversation as well. Mm-hmm. And I chose four books, and you mm-hmm. chose four books. Mm-hmm. And and you chose a book last month, mm-hmm. and then I chose the book this month. Oh, it's shady! I didn't even read your book. That's shady. Oh, that is shady. That's that's unfriendlike of you. <laughs> it's unladylike. <laughs> it's unladylike. <laughs> how how very dare you? <laughs> how very dare you? <laughs> Did you like my segue? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, I gave, I gave you I gave you the power of the segue. You give strong segue. I do. I do. I give very good segue. Very you're you're good segue. known. You're known internationally for your segues. Yeah, I'm an international yeah. segueer. Mm-hmm. So, what's the book? <laughs> the book this week is "Backwards and Forwards" by David pew, Ball. Pew, pew. Pew, pew, now, pew. It, it's interesting because we have mentioned on the podcast many times before "Backwards and Forwards" by William Ball. We have mentioned A Sense of Direction by Michael Ball. <laughs> and it's always been Backwards and Forwards by David Ball. So <laughs> That is funny because I I was look, actually looking at the... I was like, is this Bill Ball's book? Is this... I looked and I was like, David Ball? <laughs> yeah. We have we we've misspoke a couple of times on the podcast, but... Girl, <laughs> but, it wouldn't be the first time. <laughs> yes, so... <laughs> So if you're if you're out there reading Sense of Direction by Bill Ball, um, good for you. Uh, but we're not going <laughs> to talk about how, that tell, today. Tell us how good it is. <laughs> to, to, yeah, write to speakpipe.com backslash theater of others and let us know how you thought <laughs> what your review of the book was. What how many stars would you give it? Because we haven't read it. <laughs> see, 
we are just one big misnomer after another. I'm sorry, David. I'm sorry, David Ball. I'm sorry. Yeah. It's a very good book. Thank you very much for your book. <laughs> yes, I agree. Very good book. So why, why, why did you pick this book, Adam? Well, when we were picking the books, uh, we were talking about books that were influential to us, books that we um, helped us as an artist, helped us as teachers, things that we either still use or we question the use of things. And um, it's the first thing I thought of because it's, for me, it's so simple. It's mm. not easy. By any, I mean, you know, simple does not mean easy, but it's so just kind of basic. Direct. It's so direct, exactly. And I thought, mm. well, if I was going to start with something, I want to start with something that is just, that can just, bypass a lot of the the worry and concern and you know uh, get I don't want I don't want people to get lost in um feelings or esoteric things or whatever and I want I just, like here's something practical do it right now and it's look how thin that is it's like yeah you know, it's an easy read y'all it's an easy you read. said you read it in two and a half hours yeah two absolutely and a half hours. I did it in two and, and a half and I, I use this in my play analysis class, and I read it again every single year because it's, it is. It's easy to read, and it's just such – it's so important. Um, and it's very clear that a lot of people don't know this type of work at all. I mean, we, had, we, we didn't even know who wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's true. Maybe, maybe that's the problem. Everybody should know it, but they get the wrong book because they've mis, misnamed the person. Yeah. Because I, I was like, is this the same guy that wrote the uh, the actor in the Target? <laughs> That's Declan Donnellan. Nope. <laughs> I was way off. Different sounding I like, name. I mean, it was a white man. So I was just like, you know. Yeah. If it's not Shakespeare, alike. it's Bill Ball. Yeah, that's true. We do all look alike. <laughs> <laughs> so, So how do we do this? Um, was this the first time that you read this book? This is the first time I've read this book. Then I would definitely love to hear your thoughts on this because I've read this uh, dozens and dozens of times. So I can talk about this backwards and forwards. Backwards oh, and forwards. I see what you did there. See what I did there? Well, I, what I but, lo- what I loved about it, um, was it was a great way to just, if you've never, ever, ever read a play before, it's a great way to understand what goes into producing a play yeah. and how to, how to make a play. And I also love that, it, that he really pushed forwards that it's about experiencing the play first before you even read it, you know, and allowing your imagination to tell you what the story is and then going back and deciphering how well the production team did in fulfilling what the playwright asked. And I also love that he talks about trust the playwright. You trusted him enough to to want to produce his work. So or or her work or their work, you know. Yeah. Trust yeah. them enough to to do what they ask. And that yeah. they can that they're giving you the cues you need to tell the story the best way possible and from your intersection. I think mm-hmm. what I love about it is it also cre- it, it also creates a, a system of of investigating a play that allows you to have a clear point of view about the choices you're making and why you're making the choices. Yeah. And it's also the and, and it's it's good for it's good for actors as well because when he talks, I mean, he starts with action. I mean, yeah. it begins with action, you know, stasis and then action, which I love that whole concept of stasis. We'll talk more about that. I love, yeah. the, I love, I love the word stasis. I love the philosophy around what he's calling stasis and how, and how it relates to this, this world. Um, but he, 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 cause one, one of the things that I, when I was going to dr- uh, drama school, I just did not, and it's dyslexic. I just did not understand the concept of action. It was such an intellectual literary term in 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 my training in the Meisner studio. Like, like it was really unclear like what a fucking action was. It took me fucking forever to understand it. And yeah. The way that he um explains it, it's so good. It's yeah. so good. Right? 
I, I love that and, concept, the trigger and the heap. Something yeah. has to happen for something else to happen. Those two yeah. things combined make an action. If yeah. something happens and then something else doesn't happen, that's not an action. Yeah. Yeah. Very clear. That's it. Very clear. Very clear. And his analogy of the car and, you know, like, you know, the car versus the driver versus the engine versus the yeah. fuel. Like, yeah. it, it just it, it, it just brings it home to, like, it's, it's done by someone who cares about theater. Yeah. What, what I love about it is that he's, like, theater matters. And yeah. it's, a, it's, it's an art form that needs to be respected and not read by dumb people. His, his, <laughs> um, his, like, yeah. once again, you can also see the, the, um, the time in which this person was writing because he's calling, he's calling his readers dumb if they're not doing yeah. the way, if you're not reading yeah. the way that he's reading, you're dumb. Yeah. He's, he's, <laughs> he's, uh, yeah, I think that was it. The last, the last word is, yeah. Good reading comes first. Read backwards, read forwards. Dumb readers finish last. That's the last sentence of the book. <laughs> he he is call he's calling his audience dumb a lot in terms of mm -hmm. that. <laughs> yeah. But but it's one of those things where like he was the he was uh what, what, let me see here. Uh artistic director of Pittsburgh Metropolitan Stage Company. He was um uh, literary director at the Guthrie Theater for for many years. Like mm. so he's reading. People are sending him plays he's reading a copious amount of plays and he's teaching playwrights at carnegie mellon and and you can just tell he loves theater and he wants it to be better and he's like you know he's talking about the problems that writers get into and the problems that directors direct themselves into because they think they've got a better idea and the fact that mm -hmm. actors sometimes can't act their way out of a paper bag because they just don't do the very early work mm -hmm. of play analysis which i know I know uh, young actors and young directors think is the most boring part of the job and table work doesn't seem interesting. And uh, why can't we just get up and start doing it? I, I do. I, I'm a very improvisational person. I can find it on my feet. No, no, not until you know some things. Yes. All of the, those things about being up on your feet, being physical, improvising, that's all still a part of the process. But if you don't know just some basic things, what I loved about what I loved about the his world around playing actions was what would happen if I didn't do this? Hmm. What are the consequences if I didn't do this particular action that's that the writer has asked me to do? Yeah. Like and and he does it in a really simple way of like answering a phone call or saying saying good morning to someone you know it's like you're saying good morning to a neighbor but if you don't say good morning to the neighbor are they going to think that you know there's an issue or you know so so that affects the quality in which you say good morning yeah that is such a fucking brilliant way to make a really specific choice that goes beyond the surface read of a yeah. simple uh, line like good morning yeah and that's a really great way to to decipher if someone is doing that kind of deep in-depth work in their acting because you can know it's with it's those moments when you're when you're watching an actor perform and they they say a line that seems to be a simple line but it's filled with so much detail it's because yeah. they've done the backwards and forwards of understanding why that particular line is being said in this particular moment by this particular person's mouth yeah within this particular given circumstance and it, i so, just it, so simple it's so simple so so simple yeah so the, the whole entire concept that, that the reason it's called backwards and forwards is um he talks about uh when you're reading um going forwards allows unpredictable possibility so if you're talking about you know uh, it's just simple hello to the neighbor because you'd have no other context after this. All you know is what you have before. It's unpredictable. You can't really do this. However, going backwards exposes that which is required. 
So mm. now if you read it, if you read it going backwards, you realize this leads to that and that needed that to go to that. And then that needed that to go before it. And when we read it going forwards, we don't know what's coming afterwards at all. So we, sometimes we don't pay attention to or give proper care to those things because it may be a throwaway line. It may be the most important thing in the play, but we don't know yet. The only way we know is to go backwards. So yep. that's the kind of the, that's the really cool concept uh, that he's talking about in the title. It's a, it's a great way to learn your lines. Like that's how it, it's so funny because you know as a dyslexic, that's the way I would learn lines. I would go backwards, like mm. because because then the logic made sense because I knew exactly because right. I I've already, I'd how already been there. Here? So then the logic yeah. makes sense on what led me to getting there. That's so funny. That's exactly how I learn lines. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, I go backwards. Hmm. I go forwards to to understand the story, but then I go backwards when I want to learn it because it tells me what led me to saying what I'm saying. How did I get to this point? How did I get to this point? And how did I get to this point? Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. And it's it's just logical. And then you start to go into the, then you start to go into, oh, wow, there's actually logic in this writing. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, it's not coming out of nowhere. These ideas are not coming out of nowhere. They're not just like flying out of space. Mm. Mm. <laughs> and I think I, the other thing that I love is um, let's talk about stasis because I think stasis mm. is a it's it's a great way to to start because yeah you know and and the same way that uh, he talks about you know each play is the, could be the beginning of the end of, like each each beginning of a play could be the end of another play previous to it like you yeah. know it's like understanding what has caused the action so can you talk about stasis. Yeah, I love this as well, because I think um, uh, I'm just speaking for directors here uh, and and young directors, especially. Um, Yeah, well, you know, you'll do the history, the backstory and things like that. But actually, what was the play that has just ended to start this play? I love that concept of, of actually thinking like, yeah, we as human beings, we have stories going on constantly. So what what was that play? Was it a different genre? You know, I'm just thinking like Cherry Orchard is a comedy, according to Chekhov. It's a comedy. It's written as a comedy. But everything that's come before this, according to uh, the backstory that Ranyevskaya leaving Paris, that's a tragedy. So a tragedy of being robbed of all of her money and her husband dying and her son dying and her running away, that's a tragedy. That story is ending. And now we're coming into this story and it's a comedy, but that doesn't mean that tragedy doesn't still live in these people because mm-hmm. that play has ended and it's still there. So what stasis is, is what's the norm? What are we walking into at the top of the play? Yeah. And then what breaks it? And sometimes stasis has already been broken. So I think he mentions in, in the book, uh, Crucible, stasis has already been broken. We, we're thrown into, um, you know, witches have, have been seen and society is, is, is disrupted. But we can understand what that means to have a society be disrupted by uh, something from the outside. But most plays start in stasis and then the characters have the most dramatic day of their life. And that's what we're watching on stage. We're watching them mm-hmm. have the most, have the worst day of their life. Can you or just can you, uh, ask Miss uh, Webster what stasis means and for our, our listeners to maybe bilingual, yeah. so we make sure that everyone's listening in the same way. What is stasis? Yeah, stasis: a period or state of inactivity or equilibrium. Yeah, so it's 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 it, the the water has not started boiling. You just the water is sitting in the pot. And yep. there has no, no one's, no one has ignited the fire yet. It's balance. It's equilibrium. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's, it's a, it's a, it's a society at peace. It's, 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 I mean, it doesn't even have to be at peace. You know, if, if you think of Oedipus Rex. Um, In action though. Inactive. Yeah. I mean, the plague has already happened, but it's not to a point where, you know, a revolution has happened. It's not, a coup hasn't happened. It's only when the wailing gets to be so much that's, that it, the stasis is broken. It's, we are just in a place of inaction, exactly. And then something, a tipping point happens and the play has begun and we're off to the races and then we can never really get back from that. We're trying to get back to that. We always want to get back to that. And the fight to get back to that or move past that is the play until we can reestablish a new stasis, which is the end of this play and the beginning mm-hmm. of another play. Yeah. Mm. 
and it, and it also it, it, once again it gives you it gives you um, an ability to make a clear choice of that's working with the writer. Yeah, you know, so you're not just like randomly throwing things in because you think they're cool. <laughs> I, <laughs> I love how he talks about atmosphere and the difference between atmosphere and specificity. Like mm. detail is what you want to focus on detail and not atmosphere. Atmosphere comes from the detail. And yeah. so many directors want to give you an atmosphere, want to give you a vibe, but you don't even understand why you're there. And so it's it yeah. becomes like uh, an ambiguous feeling, but there's no detail. If, if there's no detail, then it doesn't make you stay. Yeah. Uh, he says, uh, uh, mood spelled backwards is doom. Is- is doom. What's what we what's what we want to avoid. So don't yeah. ever talk about mood. Yeah. 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 Mood, mood, mood comes from the backwards. detail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and 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 that's also how Toxy works as well. You know, my research around you know that that divine performance energy that the Balinese say um, happens in those very heightened moments. It's like the ability to fully commit to details, like a Balin, like a like the gamelan form or the dance form or the shadow puppet form um, allows an atmosphere of energy to come in because we contribute to it because we're being affected by it because we know where we are. Mm -hmm. Because we know where we are, we begin to create a vibration collectively as a gathering of human bodies and that creates the atmosphere. But if yeah. you're trying to create a mood or an atmosphere and you have several different bodies, and that's one, and then that's what I love about what he said about character, you know, where he says that, you know, what you do is going to is going to affect every single person differently because of the lens and um 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 uh filter in which they're they're identifying your role. Yeah. I like the. I mean, I'm, just, I'm looking at the 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 backwards and forwards. A technical manual for reading plays, and I I, I like that technical manual part because I, I I think sometimes we forget that what we do is an art, but what we do is also a craft, mm. and it requires crafting. And we 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 a lot of times bypass the crafting part of things because we like the experimentation part. And we like the finishing part, but we don't like the necessarily the crafting part of things. And it's it's like saying, you know, I really want to build uh, that amazing Lego structure, but I don't want to lay out the brick, the Lego bricks, <laughs> and <laughs> and put them to, together piece by piece. I just want to have the Lego structure. Yeah, Le- the, that Lego dinosaur is awesome. That six yeah. foot Lego dinosaur is awesome. Yeah, but I need to find the little green bricks and the mm. things that connect them at the top, and then I, you know, it's mm. like. It's it is it's it's it can be tedious if you make it tedious, but it can also be fun to actually go, holy crap! Like that's how that led to that, and this little nugget that the that the playwright wrote, you know, pays off later on. It's mm-hmm. the belief that it's the belief that what the playwright was doing, they meant to do. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I always I always love you know. Uh, when, when, when doing Shakespeare and people are like, can we just cut this line? And I go, you know, <laughs> Shakespeare wrote this out by hand. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, so he, he didn't have to write this out by hand. He chose to write this out by hand. And then, you know, it was all memorized by the actors and what was remembered later on. So of course we've lost something. We've gained something by the actors, but it's not superfluous. So what is it? What, why is it there? What's it doing there? What's its purpose? Why mm. shouldn't we cut that? And if it's a if it's a modern context, it won't make any sense. Okay, maybe possibly, but you know, I think he he mentions the scene with Polonius early in Hamlet, that really shows Polonius being a schemer, a conniver, mm-hmm. a spy. Mm-hmm. And if you cut that from the play, then Polonius is just a doddering old fool. And well, the, and the spying is is a major theme inside right. of Hamlet. Everyone's spying. Everyone's right. poking around the corner. Everyone's, I mean. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, their whole point in the whole play is they're spying all on Hamlet and reporting back. And, right. you know, someone's looking at someone's around the corner, you know, and I, I love I love and I think the other thing, what's so great about this uh, book is that it, it if you don't know what dramaturgy is, read this book. That's yeah. dramaturgy. That's dramaturgy. 
And, you know, yeah. we, we spent so much time, like, talking about, like, you know, what what is dramaturgy? And, you know, it's not defined. I think, you know, if you read this book, this book will tell you what a good drama... What, this is good dramaturgy for everyone, for the designers, yeah. for the directors, for the actors. Like, yeah. and he talks about it. Like, and so that we are all doing the research that's necessary for telling the story. Yeah. You know, and... and it only... Yeah. No, go ahead, please. No, go ahead. It only what? It, it, I think it only makes your, I mean, I think a lot of people feel that if they do this kind of stuff, if they get really nitty gritty with it, if they get really technical with things, that it, it, it hinders their artistry. But I actually think it, it only makes your artistry clearer. It gives you mm. a solid foundation of which to make your own work instead of, instead of I have a great idea, but it doesn't have any basis in reality, but it's a cool idea, then, you know, it, it's like a strong breeze can come by and blow, blow over your idea because there is no there there. Mm. But when you do the work, when you do the research, when you find the little Lego bricks and then put your idea, one, you could test your idea immediately, but then it also gives it a solid foundation. It's rock solid. There's not going to be, you know, a comment or a breeze or a critic that can knock it over because no, no, it's based in reality of the play. I found it here in this play. It's proven in the play. And my lens, my personality, my artistry exposes this thing. I also yeah. love where he talks. I, I just love this book. I'm, it, it, as, you're, as you're talking, it's just more things are coming in. Like when he talks about like understanding the cultural reference for the audience for the which the play was written for. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. like understanding what the uh, Elizabethans felt about the Danes at that time. Right. You know, understanding what, uh, you know, the the Greeks uh, uh, thought of the time period in which Oedipus was written. You know, yeah. what was the aesthetic value for that time period? You know, and it's like, because I, I don't think I've ever seen a Oedipus that, that didn't, that covered, that truly covered that particular aesthetic of that time period. It's always right. been like the, the shiny pillars and the, yeah. you know, the, the regalness of like Oedipus having brought everything back, but it's not, they, it's, it's, it's too contemporary for right. the actual um, paganistic time that it was, that, that the play actually is created from, which right. makes more sense. The yeah. actions that everyone does. It's One not a society oracle, yet. Right. Yeah, going to the honest. Oracle to get the prophecy and understand what yeah. the, listening to listening to the, the shaman healer prophets coming to tell the story, pulling to, to, to cutting someone's eye, cutting your own eyes out. Yeah. Like that is, that is the, the, the aesthetic uh, value and, and cultural mores of these people that ripping one's eyes out is an action that one would do. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, it's a pre-democratic society. It's not Athens. It's not fifth century Athens, which is when this would have been performed. It's a thousand years before that. It's, you know, it's mm -hmm. so far beyond our understanding of it's regal and upright and so very, you know, it's, it's more stone age. It's more, it's, it's, it's live or li you know, um, kill or be killed, uh, live and let die. It's, it's really kind of, it makes a lot more sense when you put it in that context. The same thing when you think about how the how the Brits would have thought about the Danes at that point. Viking raids London were bridges. still, you know, Viking raids were still a thing. So we're not watching, you know, a, you know, the Danes that we think of today, a very you know socialistic. They burnt down the society. London Bridge. That's what yeah. the London Bridge is falling down comes from. The Danes destroyed the bridge. So what we're talking about is we're talking about these brutal, awful Viking, pagan people. Not, right? you know, they talk about not, drinking like a Dane. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so finding the original context is, 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 is interesting. My, um, one of my teachers, uh, who, whose book I also chose will be, uh, coming up pretty soon. Um, uh, Brian Bogart? Kulik, no, Brian Kulik. Okay. He, um, he, he talks about, you know, that the role of a director is to transport the, with a classic play, especially is to transport the audience to the play or the play to the audience. But no matter what, you have to build the bridge for that transportation from steel. Like if mm. you're going to take the audience to, you know, 1899 Doll's House, you're going to place it in 1899 Norway, then you've got to bring the audience there. You have to make them understand what it meant 
to be in 1899 Norway. But if you're going to update Doll's House, which means you're going to bring the Doll's House to today, then you've got to make it make us understand why these words make sense in today's context. You know, we talked about, I've mentioned this before, um, the version that uh, uh, Effendi did at La Salle, uh, where he took Doll's House and he put it in a, uh, a modern Malay household. And having the actress playing Nora leave at the end actually had consequence Mm-hmm. in a modern context, whereas, you know, mm-hmm. okay, so who cares if she leaves her husband? That's a modern society. But in a traditional uh, Muslim household, that does have consequence. And all of a sudden, the audience could feel that it was a palpableness of going, oh, oof, that's that's a tough decision. That's a, you know, what's she going to do with her children? How is she going to get by in society? Those kind of things have consequence. So you can bring the audience to the play, but you have to recontextualize it without rewriting the play. Otherwise, just rewrite the play. Write your own mm-hmm. play. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So how did do the Tarantata? I don't know. I, I can't remember if there was if there was a specific dance. Yeah, I can't remember that. But that's but 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 you could find you could find mm-hmm. you know what is what is a dance that is traditional but also a little forbidden. You know, maybe it maybe it comes from indigenous culture pre Islamic. You know. There's ways of there's ways of finding those things that are like, you know, maybe dance is taboo in this culture, uh, but where does she get it? Why is she doing it? Because that scene is supposed to be erotic, it's supposed to be um, childlike. There's a lot of things that are happening in that scene. And the release of the poison, she's releasing yeah. the poison. Exactly, exactly. So, I also loved. I <laughs> I love this book, Adam. Good. I'm glad. Um, what he says about theatricality. Yeah. Yeah. And the use of theatricality. And it's, and, um, and that it's, 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 it, the use of theatricality is to bring forward really the the most important concepts yeah. of the play. Yeah. Identification of theatrical elements is important because good playwrights put their most important material into their most theatrical moments. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Bingo. And this is why theater matters. This is, and that's also understanding the form of theater. Yeah. You need to understand it. You, that it, it's theater. It's not television. It's, yeah. It's not film. And the thing that we have in theater that they don't have is theatricality. Yeah. So why, why not do that? Why, why go boring? Why go naturalistic? Do what theater does best. And, and it's funny because like, it, it, like it's, I, this is my first time reading a book and there's just so many parallels to what he says to what I teach and what I, what I believe, like when he talks, like when I when I teach the rhyming couplet, mm-hmm. like when I talk about the rhyming couplet, um, I talk about it like, you know, it's like you know you're watching Law and Order, and then like you get a little bit more information about what's going to happen in the next scene, and then the music goes dun dun dun, yeah. and that's what the rhyming couplet's supposed to do. It's supposed to go dun dun dun, push you into the action that's going to happen, you know, in in the next in the next scene. Um, I- I don't mm-hmm. know why. I mean, I, I felt I felt stupid reading that. I've read it, you know, like I said, I've read this book dozens of times. I don't know why that landed for me for the first time, <laughs> this time reading it through. I always thought of rhyming couplets as a way of speeding out of the scene, as like a kind of a, you know, as a, as a lift to the next scene. Whereas, whereas what he's talking about is like every single rhyming couplet at the end of every scene is actually a preview mm. for what's going to happen next. Yeah. It, so So this law and order kind of thing is like, you know, it's like, it's like a, a, a teaser. Mm-hmm. Every single rhyming couplet at the end of a scene is a teaser and it always pays off. Like he, they, they, we, we, they never say anything that never follows through. And I've just completely ignored that fact and just gone for the speed, for the uplift, for the, the pushing through part. And well, the lit- you have to go, you have to go just go for the literal. Like it, honestly, the rhyme is there for a reason. You have yeah. to bring the rhyme out, the rhyme, the place, the thing. Yeah. 
in which I catch the contents of the king. Right? You have to scenes later he does. Right? You gotta you gotta you have to bring the rhyme out. It's not about, you know, covering it up. Bring it out. Yeah. Um and as you know, it's all in the text. Yeah. So and 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 you also have to think of it in the sense of like it's musical. You know, the the way he writes it's like musical notes. And the configuration of the consonants and the vowels are there for a particular effect because they didn't have Jack David Burmester to make, you know, the music, the transition music, you right, know, right, right. The only way they could do it was through the text. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. And so, all right. So, what are your favorite parts? That's that's me. I, I basically have covered the whole book. So no, what, yeah, <laughs> what are your favorite parts? I mean, I, I think if you know this book is this book is ninety six pages long. It's not a long book, but if people just were to read the first uh, ninety pages, no, they don't even have to read the first ninety pages. Honestly, I think I think if you could read part one, so. From page nine to page thirty-five, you're you're going to be better than you know seventy-five percent of your colleagues out there who are not doing this for sure. The first couple of chapters are so absolutely vitally necessary and simple because it talks about obstacle, it talks about action, it talks about uh, conflict in a very yeah. understandable way. Well, conflict. Let's talk about conflict. Yeah conflict is related to the obstacle you can't it's not a conflict if there's no obstacle exactly <laughs> if there's nothing to get around <laughs> then there's, there's there's no conflict but i think i think also for those of you um teachers out there who are you know who've been around the block go into it with an open heart because you will learn something because what he's, he's not talk he's not inventing the wheel. Like we know all of this stuff, but if yeah. you go into it with like, Oh, well, I know this, I know this, I know this. You'll miss the subtle details that he offers that, that provide a lot more clarity that you can use in your classroom to help students. Like I was understand um, actions. Cause maybe the way you're teaching it might not be as clear as some of the the, the strategies in which it, he offers. Yeah. So I would say go into it with an open heart, so you can really, so you can really glean some of the really lovely um, nibbles that he gives you. Obstacles are easily ignored, unfortunately. Actors remember motivation, but not obstacles. The last two minutes of a ninety-five to twenty-seven basketball game is like a motivation without an obstacle not worth watching mm -hmm. exactly exactly yeah i love that and once again if you're reading it backwards it, it it makes it makes the discovery of the obstacle more exciting because it's almost as if the obstacle just reveals itself because you're in a place and you're reading it backwards and the, oh that's how i got here oh yeah. that's interesting so it actually, I think, I think the 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 value of going backwards and forwards is that it makes it a game. It makes mm -hmm. it a um, where's Carmen San Diego? It's like where's where's <laughs> Wally? You know, where's yeah. Waldo? You know, and and it's and and that it's playful. You want to be you want to be playful in your work anyway. So then it becomes it becomes a really fun exercise for you know, a, a second, third, fourth, fifth read, as opposed to, I got to get all the details down. I've ticked the box of, of finding this particular thing. I've ticked the box of finding this particular thing. But like going in this direction is it, 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 it and you learn it. It's yeah. a great way to learn it. Like I said before, yeah. when I'm, when I'm learning lines, I go backwards. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. So, how do you rate it? What do you think about it? 
What are my categories again? <laughs> I don't know. You you made them up last time. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so the overall mm-hmm. contribution of the text was one, yeah. right? Uh huh. The the relevance and uh, importance of the content was the other one. Mm-hmm. And then our favorite uh, chapter. chapter or or concept. Yeah. Yeah. Do I have to read it first? Uh, no, I, I can do it. Okay, so no, so. You, I'll do it. I'll do it. You, you read all it right. first last time. All right, all right. I, th- I think I think the the new reader has to read it before the okay. old reader. All right, fair enough. Book. So for the overall contribution um, of this text, I give it a ten. Ten out of ten. <laughs> okay. I, I think we had a five because I think we had five last time, but it's okay. Ten. Oh, oh <laughs> shit! We had, Did we only have five. <laughs> <laughs> I get a five. Okay, it gets a solid five. It gets a solid Good. five. Yeah, I mean it. It should be a staple in every theater maker's library. Everyone yeah. should know this. Like everyone yeah. knows that Shakespeare. Everyone needs to know the backwards and forwards because it's just yeah. a, a a really great tool to use and he talks about it as a tool you mm-hmm. know and and to be able to use it's like you you need to know how to use the hammer before you use it yeah instead creating like understanding understanding the tools in which to tell the story of you because then you can because then you can go into your specialty once you've done this then you can go into the designing then you can go into preparing the role then you can go right. into directing right right Right, but if you haven't if you haven't done this work before, you're gonna you. <laughs> as he says, it's a dumb reading. Yeah, you're gonna be you be don't be a dummy, don't be a dummy, because you also have to trust that your audience knows more than you. Yeah, they can cry bullshit. Right? They're very adept story, uh, adept at, at at hearing a lot of stories, and they can tell when. That doesn't ring right. That feels fake. That something mm-hmm. got left out. Something got missed. Yeah. The bullshit meter is going to come out. Yeah. Okay. So what's your, what's your review? What's your what's your number? Yeah, I, I'd say five as well. I mean, you know, I, uh, I, I like I said, I use it all the time in my work. I teach it in play analysis class. I think it's pr- the simplest, clearest uh, example of play analysis, and it's I've seen it with my students' work. Uh, that it's a concept once you once you kind of get get it you get it and you understand it and it's it's you can't kind of go it's like it's like learning that oxygen exists you can't go back to, to not knowing that oxygen exists you can you can ignore oxygen of course but you can't go back and go but oxygen doesn't exist so it's once you know how to do this if you don't do it it's your choice it's your choice mm-hmm. that's your that you're, it's not it's not ignorance anymore yeah. It's your choice to be a dummy. As, as, exactly. As David Ball would say. That's not those aren't as, my words. As David Ball says, you're a dingus if you don't do this. Um, <laughs> those are his words, not mine. A dingus. <laughs> Can you look at Webster's dictionary and, and tell me what a dingus is? Yeah, let's see. Dingus <laughs> meaning. Uh used to refer to something one cannot or does not wish to name specifically. Okay. All right. That's better than Michelle Kwan. <laughs> dingus is a very informal word for an object whose name you don't know, have forgotten, or can't recall at the moment. Uh, okay. Dingus, they're, they're put that into your library, y'all. Okay, yeah. so dingus. overall <laughs> content and contribution. Yeah. Five. 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 Even though he does call us all dumb. But five, five. I think it's, and I think it's favorite great. chapter concepts. Oh. Do I have to pick one? No. Okay. No. Whatever works for you. Okay, so I'll, I'll pick one. One. I'll, okay, this one's so as a as an actor. As an actor, um, I would say his um, 
his uh, work on actions. Yeah. As a director, I would say the um, understanding the audience for which the play was originally written for. Yeah. As a writer, I would say theatricality. And as a theater artist, backwards. Go backwards. Yeah. And you, my friend? Uh, I like the, I like actions as well. The trigger and the heap. The idea that an action needs uh, something that leads to something else. So somebody pulls a trigger. That's the first part of the action. A bullet comes out and kills a body. That's a heap. Trigger and heap. That's I mean, it's just a simple concept, and some I can easily remember that when I'm going. Okay, this ah, uh, this led to that. That's an action. That whole intersection there is a trigger, and that's a heap. And sometimes a trigger is pulled, and that heap doesn't happen until a page later. That's an action. You know, that's so yeah. It's that, a, it's a, that's a concept. long range. It's a long range shot. You could shoot the bullet up into the air, and then it lands yeah. somewhere. It's a sniper rifle from two miles away, right? Yeah. Um, I think that's I think that's really, really important for me. I love stasis, as we mentioned before. Mm, um, definitely, I'm I'm looking at character uh, when he talks about uh, play. Characters are not real. You cannot discover everything about them from the script. The playwright cannot give much because the more that is given, the harder it is to cast the part. The playwright mm. must leave most of the character blank to accommodate the nature of the actor. Good playwrights limit their choices of bones to those which make the character unique. Onto that uniqueness, the actor hangs the rest of the human being. The bones, the carefully selected character traits included in the script, are revealed via action. Mm. Yeah. Mic drop. Yeah. <laughs> it's a oh, good one. Cr- it's a good one. <laughs> um, okay. Well, okay. I think... I, I I think we've 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 solved the problem of the universe. Everyone <laughs> needs to read this. Everyone needs to read backwards and forwards by David it's, Ball. It's two hours out of your day. It's it'll change your life apparently. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But go into it with if you if you if you know all this stuff already. I just make sure you go into it. Just with refresh. Go, re- just go re- refresh. Just refresh. Yeah. 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 Yeah, 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 yeah. And if you know nothing at all, don't be a dumb reader. Don't be a dingus. <laughs> Don't be a dingus. Don't be a dingus. <laughs> I like that. I like I like the way that word feels in my mouth. Mm-hmm. I love the mm-hmm. way a dingus feels in my mouth. Oh, dingus, God. dingus. Don't be a dingus. <laughs> I watched I, I watched The Good Place again, and they use that word a lot. So it's ah, uh, see, I love don't that be a dingus. Now. Don't be a dingus. Hey, stupid dingus. It, what's the etymology? Is it? Is it a? Is it a? Is it um? Oh, is it man, Yiddish? I don't know. Let's see. Uh, Dutch or German? Oh, okay. So then you have to say dingus. <laughs> don't be a dingus. <laughs> is that is that how the Dutch sound? Dangas, don't be a dangas. <laughs> I apologize to our Dutch listeners out there. Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm being a I'm being a dingus. You're being a dingus. Oh my god. I got it. Ladies and gentlemen, non-binary conforming individuals, please welcome to the stage. Our drag king. Dingus Khan. Boo. <laughs> so, um, what's our next book, Adam? <laughs> our next book, our next book is is uh, one of your choices, and this mm-hmm. is "To the Actor" by Michael Whoa. Chekhov. Oh, yeah. see, now we're going. Now we're going thick. We're going. You know, we started. We started light. Yeah. 
now we're going we're we're digging deep now we're going into the the core yes to the actor by michael chekhov and now did michael chekhov write that or did david ball write that or was it was a bill ball i was michelle kwan that was michelle kwan <laughs> she gets so, around not michelle kwan i swear yeah you know <laughs> okay so michael chekhov to the actor that's um yes. our next book so um do you have any provocations or should we go to a break I think we're at the end, actually. I, I don't think we... We are at the end, but, uh, you know, we, we're not going to be able to listen to the stereo sounds of JDB. I know. He has the day off, I guess. Okay, we'll give him the day off. He works hard. He did He did do a, he did do a live one the other he day. Did. So. He did do a live one, it's true. Yeah, and I mean, so my, only provocation, my only provocation is to pick the book up. Read it. <laughs> pick it up. Just pick it up. Just pick it up. <laughs> Carry it, carry it around with you until you feel carried around compelled to read and it. learn it through osmosis. Read it through osmosis. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just just put it here and. I think that's a dumb reading of the book. That's a very that's a dumb, dumb reading, reading of the book. book. <laughs> yeah, and my provocation is clear. If you've read it, if you've if you've read it before or know what's in there, read it again. Make it just yeah. one of those like staples. This before you go into a project. Just go into your backwards and forwards just to be reminded. It's always nice to be reminded by people who know what they're doing. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed. And how will we know that they did this, Adam Marple? They're going to go to speakpipe.com backslash theater of others. Again, speakpipe.com backslash theater of others. Theater of others, all one word. Theater with an R-E. You can leave a 90-second voice message. We'll play it on air uh, and comment to your provocation or your question back to us or your answering of the of the question. Uh, also, podcast at theaterofothers.com. You can leave an email mm. to us there. Uh, we are also on Instagram, Facebook, Instagram, and yeah. our website. We're all easily, readily available to get in touch with. We want to hear from you. get a hold of us, y'all. Come on. Yeah. Come on. What's, what's, hold, what's holding you back? Come and hold us. Come and hold us. We got you. We got you. Yeah, we got you. Um, but how are they going to know about this next book? How are they going to know about all these amazing things that we've got going on this year, Booty? What do they, what do they need to do? Well, they well. must. Well, they must subscribe, 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 subscribe. We come into your inbox every week. Er week we come into your inbox. And how are you going to know that? Because you have subscribed. <laughs> and right. then you can be like my Uber driver and give us five star, five star, five star. I give you five star, you give me five star. So it's a, it's a win-win deal. And if you are just so in, in, in inclined to leave us a message, especially on Spotify, you can leave us a message and it goes into the algorithm that these guys actually know what they're talking about. Leave us a comment. Leave us a comment. Yeah. We are in the top 5% podcast of the world come on help push us to number one y'all number one then oprah yeah. will say yes don't you want to hear us talking to oprah who don't doesn't want, want to have us talking to oprah yeah. yeah don't you want to have oprah on the podcast why hello. why aren't you why aren't you helping us get oprah on the podcast hello it's all about y'all it's all about y'all show the why love. can't why can't you help us get Oprah on the podcast, folks? Why can't you help us get Oprah on the podcast? <laughs> I want Oprah on the podcast. <laughs> Oprah, I'm not, I, mean, I want Oprah on the podcast. Life goals. Yeah, that's great. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> Could you imagine what would we even talk to Oprah about, honestly? What, um, what, theater, what theater related thing would we talk to Oprah about? Color Purple. And then because she's a producer on it. At this yes, <laughs> and then I would ask her the 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 million dollar question. I would say, "Were you silent or silenced?" I thought I thought the million dollar question was gonna was gonna be, "Can you give us a million dollars?" I thought that was the million dollar question, but okay. I, uh, well, I think the million dollar question would be, "Do I get a new car?" I'm sure she loves hearing that. I'm sure that's the joke that she loves hearing from every single person. Uh, well, no I, I, I think I think Oprah's getting further and further away from our podcast. The more we talk about what we're going to ask her, because she's going to know already know we're going to ask her. That's right. That's right. We got to keep these these questions spontaneous sounding. Um, hello, NDA. 
Yeah. <laughs> oh, Not down at all. NDA. <laughs> mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> Adam, it's so good to see you. It's always great to see you, booty. I love you so much. I love you too. <laughs> Talk to you soon. Yes. Always. Every <laughs> single week. Er, wait. <laughs> and for y'all, we'll be back in your inbox next week. Bye. <laughs> Thanks for joining us this week on the Theater Brothers Podcast. Make sure to visit our website, theaterbrothers.org, where you can subscribe to the show in iTunes, Stitcher, or via RSS, so you'll never miss a show. While you're at it, if you found value in this show, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us out too. A special thank you to Purple Planet for the music you've heard. The Theater Brothers creates a shared community of artists and audiences for the purposes of exploring the most profound issues of our lives and times. We believe the play watches the audience. The audience is necessary and they are witness to what happens. And you get to be witness to us making that happen. The purpose of this podcast is to open up our process and let you in. We're peeling back the curtain, so to speak, and encouraging you to follow along, to ponder, prod, and question, to join us and criticize us if need be. Being a witness is no passive task and requires much from you. Are you up for the journey? Be sure to tune in next week for our next journey. <laughs>